Hello and welcome back to NBA Basketball Talk. This is NBA Shark Season. All right, everyone, we're back. Woo! Very Woo! exciting. Come on, all right, right. All right. Out of your so here we are one. with shark season, everyone's favorite time of year. There's sharks, they swim, people like water. There's no NBA shark team, so we got the San Jose Sharks hat. Represent. Which is, you know, sharks are underrepresented in, in professional sports is all I'm going to say. There's a lot of different types of sharks. We have five here on this list, um, and I, I don't think there's a single team named the Mako Shark, the Great White Shark, the Hammerhead Shark, the Nurse Shark, or the Bull Shark. No, no, they, they and you know it's there really should be more shark references across. And I'm not even obviously they're not. You don't need six in the NBA. But I can't think of any colleges that go shark. I can't think of any other leagues that go shark. It's a fairly terrifying, you know, looking creature, and it gets very ignored across the uh, mass. The hammerheads. Operation. That sounds like a pretty. The New Jersey Hammerheads. There we go. The new basketball team to replace the Nets. Yes, let's do it. <laughs> Dibs. I just bought a franchise, suckers. Okay, Mongo bought a franchise. The rest of us are still here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, easy pickings. This is why this is why Kawhi normally doesn't let me out of his dining room because all, all heck breaks loose when I'm allowed to go anywhere else on location. <laughs> That's fair. All right, let's start this off with the Mako Shark. So we have the Mako Shark. It is the short finned Mako. It lives in the open ocean. It can grow to about twelve feet. The particular superlative for this shark is that they are known as the fastest in the ocean. So, guys, my question to you is, who's the Mako Shark of the NBA? Who is the fastest in the league? Now, I have a surprise player here. No one, no one, and I mean not a single person, ever thought of this player. Yep, no one, not a single person. Uh, I got Ja. He's yep. being no facetious, else. sports fans. He is lying to you. So, but I'll say this: I don't know if Jaws actually the fastest because I really don't. Because it's NBA; it's not about necessarily speed so much as about being quick. Uh, quickness is much more important. Uh, lateral speed is very helpful and stuff like that. But Jaw does do very well with that. He gets the lane very well. He's a very good slasher, very reminiscent of young Derrick Rose um, and older point guards in general, where that was still a thing that they did. Um, Tommy, I, I believe you also put down Ja. I did. So tell us why you picked him. Uh, it's pretty much the same reason you did. I mean, he's very agile. He could weave around people if he needs to. Like, what, what more can be said that hasn't been said? So I'll say this. Kevin also went with Ja Morant. And uh, Kilroy, to your point, I did try to find a way to quantify this. And so I went to NBA 2K22's speed rankings, which, of course, is not particularly science in any way, but it at, least gives, right, it at least gives us something to go on. Um, John Morant, who also caught my attention in this discussion, comes in at three. Um, he is behind Russell Westbrook and De'Aaron Fox. But again, if I were to... We talked about Westbrook from like five years ago. Uh, well, well, no, because again, like you said, speed is not just running a 40 yard dash. It's the fact that when I'm looking at John Morant, if I blink, he suddenly has a layup. You know, it's it's definitely that quickness. And so I agree with you on Ja. I'm going to go to somebody else real quick, just so this is not just the shortest show in history. Um, it's the same idea as Ja. But when I think of sharks and when I think of all fast predators, when you think of like an alligator or a snake or a shark or anything, it's not just that speed, but it's that, you know, it's that sort of. Swim, that, you know, that, that swim move, as they call it. Um, and I think back to 2017, where a very fast player, a guy who's actually rated 10th 
in NBA 2K, had to play a college game three on five. It was a game literally designed to trap him, and it didn't stop him. I don't know if you guys remember this. It's Colin Sexton. Um, think back to that. It was Alabama against Minnesota 2017. Sexton was uh, due to Alabama got in crazy foul trouble. A bunch of guys got ejected, um, and it didn't stop. He's just too fast. Um, so, again, NBA 2K says John Moran is faster than Colin Sexton. I think I'm with you guys just in raw speed. Morant is the more impressive speedster. Um, but I'd re be remiss if I didn't – if I'm just comparing to a fast shark, Colin Sexton is is like that. That's a good choice. Good choice. All right. Let's move on to the great white shark. So the great white shark is among the biggest and deadliest oceanic apex predators. And what on earth does that mean for us? Well, what we are trying to figure out is we are trying to figure out who's the biggest predator in the negative sense of the word. Now, for those of you who don't know, the great white shark became popular with Jaws. Uh, and while it became popular, and now most people have a, a famous shark that comes to mind, they also have a lot of wrong conceptions about sharks. And so uh, in the same way that Jaws brought a lot of negative connotation to the great white shark, my question to you guys is, who brings the negative attention worst to their team? Well, this is an easy one. I have the Nets trio of Kevin Durant, Ben Simmons, and Kyrie Irving. All three of them are notoriously negative personalities. Uh, Kevin Durant, pretty much since he left OKC, uh, was has become a villain in the NBA, but not like LeBron, who is still like an endeared villain. Kevin Durant is the villain. Uh, ben Simmons has not even come close to living up to his expectations. His inability to shoot a ball beyond five feet is impressive, to say the least, uh, especially seeing he was, you know, supposed to be this amazing guy. He was supposed to be up there in the LeBron echelon. Um, obviously, he's never. he was never going to be as good as LeBron, but, you know, conceptually coming out, there were such high expectations. He chose to go to LSU, was was pretty much non-existent there as well. Uh, came to the NBA, has been pretty much outside of his amazing defense and very good passing and floor vision. His He's lackluster on offense. Um with his inability to score and but draws so much attention. He 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 was the whole headline this past offseason, not this current offseason, but the year before, with his his wanting to no longer be a 76er because they hurt his feelings. Uh and and currently right now, Kevin Durant is doing that with the Nets. He's demanded a trade. And I believe the current possibility he is landing is Boston. Um and then, of course, the last person on that trio would be Kyrie Irving, who uh, is, was very selfish. Um, and I'm not even talking about just this past year with COVID. He's been selfish his whole career since moving on from Cleveland and LeBron. When he went to Boston, he was a very selfish player. He would not play through any sort of injury. Now, I don't necessarily condone players playing in through injuries that are potentially uh, could hurt them longevity of their career or their longevity of their life. But like he wouldn't play through like a hangnail or something. Like Obviously I'm exaggerating a bit here, but there was lots of times where he was in Boston where he was hurt and he probably could have played through. He chose to have weird surgery times. I think it was a surgery he had right before the playoffs, a playoff game or something. It was very weird. That, and he didn't communicate it well. He And then he, he's always like, oh, yeah, I'm going to stay. Or, oh, yeah, I love it here. And then he, he, he left. And he did that in Cleveland, kind of. I mean, he was traded in Cleveland, but he kind of did that in Cleveland. He did that in Boston. He's essentially done with Brooklyn. He wants to play out the season, but Brooklyn doesn't really want him. Uh, and they're just going to – I mean, at this point, hopefully they can get a trade done. If they can't, they'll just keep him because – a body is better than nothing, especially seeing they don't want Houston to get better draft picks. But those three, and I would have a fourth on here too, but he's no longer with the team, and that's 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 James Harden. 
Tommy, who are your who do you got? You already said him, James Harden. <laughs> well, you talk about James Harden. I didn't talk about him. Good point. Good point. So yeah, I went with James Harden. Um, if you follow his career ever since OKC to now, it's just been a long story of of just things not working out. Either he didn't fit well as a player. Like look at Houston. He, he they tried an experiment with Chris Paul. He was the problem there. They sent away Chris Paul and got Russell Westbrook. Fell apart there. Send him to to Brooklyn. Same story. He's with Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. Doesn't work out there. They send him to the 76ers. It, it's it's kind of a never ending story with James Harden, where he doesn't like where he's at, so he wants to move on. Kind of like what you said with Durant and what you said with Simmons. Yeah, and also for those of you, uh, we haven't really been uh, updating much of the pat this right now because there's been a little bit of a slow uh, slow trickle after free agency. Uh, but James Harden did sign a two year deal this offseason with the Sixers, where the second year is a player option. Um, so again, he he's he's doing that. Hey, if you guys aren't serious contenders, I'm just gonna leave potentially, right? Like he has them by the neck, he has them in in his grasp, and he at any point next year, uh, next offseason, be like, nah, I'm done with you guys. And there's not much that they can do. They don't. They have terrible contract on uh, with Tobias Harris. Um, they they don't know what to do with Therese, uh Tyrese Maxey and um, whether or not they want to keep him, whether or not I, I don't quite understand if they know what they want to do. They they want to contend, but they also don't want to to mortgage their future. So they're kind of in a, a weird spot. And at the same time, Joel Embiid isn't getting younger. Does have a history of injuries. Even this past year wasn't really able to stay healthy as, as, towards the end, which cost them at points. And then, like, another thing, like, if, if you really look down, like, in the nitty-gritty, like, just look at the Chris Paul and, and Harden situation. Everyone was like, oh, Chris Paul's the problem. Then it comes out later on, oh, no, it was James Harden. Because, look, once once uh, Chris Paul gets out of there, he's, he's playing his heart out and gets to the finals with the Suns. So, and it just really goes to show who was really the problem there. Now. I, I want to say this real quick, Ma, Mongo and Tommy. What are your thoughts on the fact that that tr- original trio from OKC, all three, have such negative light on them in oh, the current era? James I mean, Hart, Russell Westbrook, Kevin Durant. People are mad that Serge Ibaka was actually the number three. So, but and now he's not. He's like a shell of his former self. Like the game is. They, these this, this was what 2015. What year did they make the finals? Was it 2012? Yeah, it's earlier than 15. I would have said 11 or 12. I'll say 12. Okay. And that's it. You know, the, now they all are separate, went their separate ways. They tried to re- hook up a couple of times with uh, James Harden with past teammates with Russell Westbrook, then with Kevin, then with Kevin Durant. And now he's back at, now he's in Philly. It's interesting. Mongo, who do you have? Um, real quick before I do mine, just, just two thoughts on two things you said, Kilroy. Um, first of all, regarding, uh, James Harden now in Philly, we'll do a little James Harden now and then, um, not only everything you said about Harden's contract is true, but also one, he immediately comes out with this, I'm taking a pay cut so we can put together a great team nonsense and immediately wants to be the hero. And he just, he can never just do anything quietly. And then, um, you know, like you alluded to, uh, he's put himself in a position where he still holds all the chips so and then on top of that you're already getting media buzz around was this kind of a wink wink deal where hey take the pay cut now we'll pay you next he literally has such a stigma to him now where he can't do anything without having to take a stand and without the media immediately thinking he's up to something it's crazy in that sense um also looking back at that thunder team from the late you know 2000 aughts early 2000 teens um I do think when we look back on this era in history, uh, we do have to keep in mind that they were all part of the generation where it was the very beginning of high schoolers not being allowed to come into the NBA. And I feel like that really matters because when Garnett came in, when T-Mac came in, when Kobe came in, whoever it might have been, they had to naturally come in humble. They They were kids at that point. 
And so I feel like forcing, we, no one really thought of the sociological side effects of doing that. They were thinking about the physical side effects and the money for the NCAA. But by letting these kids play one year as you know, superstars, giving them their one shot at March Madness, letting them be, you know, have a bigger profile when they came into the NBA because they now got ESPN coverage, you know, nationally and monthly. I think that really goes to some of these guys' heads. And so them all getting a chance to come in in that sense, I think we're going to look back and say was psychologically probably bad for these guys, which is why we seem to have so many more villains from the like 2005 to 2020 era than we do from, you know, earlier times. Um, so just a little theory there. Um, as for well, this I question, think social media has to do with that. Oh, absolutely as well. I mean, socially in general, 19, 20 year olds are, are being empowered. But again, not the point of the episode here. We're in shark season. Um, and so going along with you guys, just so you know, Kevin also said um, that he would take Kyrie, but he would give honorable mentions to Harden and Simmons. And so that's where I'm going completely different here because I'm kind of looking at this. I, I went analytical here, so bear with me. Um, it's the same logic behind why it always felt a little gross when Kobe or Shaq would win an MVP, because it's like, how can you give, how could they be the most valuable when there's a guy with so much value standing right next to them? By that same logic, Kuro, I know you found the loophole by just giving it to everybody, but I couldn't call Kyrie the biggest jerk, like having the most jerk value when there are other guys who would be right on that MVP of jerk list with him. Um, so I kind of took the whole net sixer saga, everyone you just mentioned, and just discarded them because they basically count each other out. I also threw them out because even though they are generally seen as, use your favorite insult word here, they do at least provide positive on-court contributions to the game. There are still 11 and 12-year-olds out there who idolize these guys. So I went a little more obscure, and I am going to everyone's favorite Midwestern villain, Grayson Allen. I want Grayson Allen for a couple reasons here. The first reason is, like I said, it's easy for Kyrie Irving to be a villain because everyone around him is a villain. It's like just being in the, you know, it's just like being in, you know, um, Cobra, right? If you're a G.I. Joe fan, right? You're a bad guy. You're with other bad guys. Cool. I'll embrace it. Grayson Allen is on a team that for all, by all seeming accounts, has it all together, right? Everyone wants to go play with the Bucks. They are they were real quick to re-sign their veterans. They look totally together. And then every couple of months you have Grayson Allen kicking somebody in the shin or kicking somebody, you know, in the baby maker. Pick your favorite, you know, Grayson Allen story. And he is the only negativity with nothing else around him. And I think the biggest thing about it is if you guys remember back in, I think it was January or February when Grayson Allen injured a Chicago Bull. And we were talking, remember, we talked to Tommy, you weren't on the show at that point, but we were talking about how normally, like in baseball, that would lead to some beanball action. Both teams would put out some of their tough guys and you'd get some fights, some injuries. When you watch the Bucks react to Grayson Allen's hard foul, not an interest in the world in defending Grayson Allen and not a care in the world afterwards in the press conference that Grayson Allen was probably going to get thrown into the stands the next time they played the Bulls. This is a... An, a kumbaya team by all accounts that could not care less about this dude. That's a jerk. And not only that, but the fact that he managed to show he, he somehow is the only dude on earth who managed to find some sort of crack in the Milwaukee armor. That's impressive. And to me, he wins negative jerk of the year for being able to do that. The last thing I'll say before you go, he provides no positivity to the league. If he retired tomorrow, Nobody would care. At least people idolize KD. At least Draymond Green is a good player. I know a lot of people in the comments are going to say, what about Draymond Green? At least he's good. Grayson Allen is a jerk who provides zero good to this league. So just on net value of negativity, Grayson Allen is just infinitely bad. So that's my logic there. I mean, my if we're being league. honest, like I, I had to remind myself who Grayson Allen was. The rule didn't say best player who's a jerk. It just said no. biggest jerk in the no, game. No, no, but it does say Hollywood. And he's not Hollywood. I would say he's Hollywood, but he's 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 the definition of your stat collector. He is the guy who has been being a jerk for so long. He's like a he, dust collector. He has right. He he's been doing. He's been compiling. I mean, he, he and again, like I'll he's say been in the league like eighteen years because he's been such a jerk. I'll say was KD a jerk at Texas? No. Was Kyrie a jerk at Duke? No. But this guy has been 
a bad dude since he was 17 years old. You can't say that about anyone else you've argued for. So he may not be the most famous, or in this case, the most infamous, but the longevity of his really bad career, bad in the sense of what he's done, you know, in terms of questionable decisions, really deserves to be honored here, especially when I'm really, let's be real, I'm just trying to not make this just the Kyrie show here. But I think because of how long he's been able to do it and get away with it in a lot of ways, it's worth a look here. I think last time we had Patrick Beverly on in this spot, I'm using him later on my list, so I could. He he's got disqualified organically. He, he's also on my list. He, he's he's on my list. Speaking of uh, lists, let's continue to the next one. We got another shock, 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 shock. The hammerhead. We got the hammerhead shark. They are great hunters, but they do it in a very weird way. They use that unusual head of theirs, shaped like a hammer, uh, which allows them to use their special sensory organs to locate food. A little unorthodox to look at, but very successful. Which, of course, begs the question, who is that shark in the NBA? Who uses some, very nice, Tommy, who uses some unusual attributes to get the job done? So I picked who we literally were just talking about, Patrick Beverly. Now you're probably saying to yourself, how? He's a traditional guard. He does very well with passing. He's a pretty decent shooter. He does what all combo guards do. Yes. But he is one of the best trash talkers. He gets in your head and he he's known for this. He's known to 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 anger the opposing players pre-game during warm-ups and he gets under your skin and that is an aspect of the game not many players do. Grayson Allen does it to a different <laughs> degree, but Patrick Beverly does it more with more nuance. Uh, you guys picked on me for my obscure answer. I'm going to go the other way with it. I, I love that choice. I'm just going to throw it out there. That is a great um, choice. Again, more on... He got disqualified because I didn't want to repeat a player. Uh, spoiler, Patrick Beverly comes up later for me, but I could have used him three or four times on this list. You guys know he's I'm a good, Patrick He's Beverly. a good player to pick for this, um, for all these. Right, because he's just he's very unorthodox, but very tenacious. I mean, he's a, he's, he's a predator in the league, in yeah. a good, I mean, I know that's a, generally a negative word in society, but he's very aggressive in the way he plays, in the way that a predator in the wild would tend to always be aggressive. I um, would so love for the Knicks, very good excuse choice. me, sorry, I would love for the Knicks to acquire him to come off the bench. Oh, he'd be great. I could dig that. Sorry, Tommy, I know you're next in the rotation here, oh, but I just had to give a little shout out. It's okay. Out. Um, I didn't go that deep with that one uh, with mine. I picked Draymond Green. Um, more, more so because like when you have weapons like Steph and Clay around you, you got to really have your own s- skill set to really make it make a splash. No pun intended. And it was intended. And no, it really was. <laughs> but uh, I feel like Draymond really earns a spot there by just the defense he plays, just his presence on the floor makes a difference. I mean, I went to a game in San Antonio when I was last time I went. It was Spurs Warriors, and neither Steph or Clay were playing, but. Just Draymond's presence alone on the court really made a difference for that team. And, you know, they won in the final uh, final seconds. Mm-hmm. His, you know, just his court awareness, you know, I could go I mean, on. He, he's a very tenacious player. He, that too. He puts up stats. You know, he, he doesn't have necessarily the most gaudy, but he is a very, he's very consistent. He's always very close to a triple double. <laughs> and that's, that's, we're spoiled by that nowadays, by the way, triple doubles that they be a lot of people think that they're not impressive. Like that was like people knock. That's people's big knock on Russell Westbrook is that he's, he's padding his stats to get those triple doubles when he's his teams like a 70 win. Uh, I think it's close to 70% wins when he has a triple double, which is just absurd. It's like, when, how can it be just stat padding if his team is successful? But anyway, Draymond also is putting up fantastic numbers. He's oh always like very very close to triple doubles so i do understand that pick tommy great great pick manga that's that's another one i can definitely sink my teeth into Mm. Um, Ah. and to the surprise of nobody here i yet again went a different way than you two um you guys went with i feel like you guys went with players who do a little bit of everything to get the job done um i went more with a player who particularly avoids doing one thing 
Um, you know, when we talk about comparing Jordan, LeBron, where does Steph fit in with the greats was the question after he won a championship. The one thing people always eventually say is it's apples and oranges because we're in the three point era right now, which makes all the stats ridiculous. So I looked at it as who's having the success at a position that should be shooting threes that of that's avoiding the three ball. So I went with DeMar DeRozan. By all accounts, when you look at DeRozan's position and scoring and MVP, you know, voting this year, you'd expect the dude to be hoisting up threes all over the place. Um, he does it on 1.9 three-point attempts per game, so less than two a game, less than one three made per game. He's doing it the other way, ton of twos, and he was fourth in the league in free throw attempts last year. And, you know, before you say, well, that doesn't sound sustainable, he did manage to play 76 games last year. Um, so he is staying, you know, pretty effective. He's staying out there on the court despite doing it in a very unorthodox way. I really like that pick, actually. It, it's a very good pick, and uh, it, it was a good choice. Um, what did Kevin pick? Kevin, I think this one, Kevin goes a little rogue on. Let's see what he had. That's what he does all the time. He's Kevin. Kevin was kind enough to surprise us. Oh, okay. I dig this one too. He went with um, Marcus Smart, um, and he justified um, basically He's that Marcus, on my list. Basically, that Marcus Smart is able to play defense at such an elite level that it's him and all the centers. Uh, you know, basically, when we start talking about um, you know defensive player of the year, I think Marcus Smart's also a unique one um, in that. I know this isn't the exact definition. Um, but he can get the job done. You know, at the end of the day, hammerhead, you think hammer, you think tool, you think effectiveness. Um, you know, I, not that I, I'm giving Marcus, not that I'm drafting Marcus Smart first in a three point shooting contest, but I trust him to get the ball down the court in a pressure situation. I can trust him to hit a three. I can trust him to guard anybody. Um, so, you know, a little unorthodox in, in how he's built, but also very, also very underappreciated, like super underappreciated. Even he just won the defensive player of, uh, defensive player of the year award and someone was coming out and saying that drew holiday was a better defender than him and i'm like not again not, not to say that drew's not a good player and stuff like that but i mean the guy literally just won an award <laughs> saying he you know he was one of the best defenders in the league and i to my understanding i could be wrong was drew ever in that conversation he he actually he actually was um at the beginning but, I mean, of, at the beginning win? of at the beginning of the season say it again did he ever win one? No, but at the beginning of the season, and I'm uh, here's what I'm, I'm saying. Um, they asked the GMs to do a survey on different elements of defense, best defenseman, best perimeter defender, everything else. And Drew Holiday, I think, came in either first or second in best perimeter defender. So, I mean, he's seen in the league as an elite defender. I get that. But I really think this was Marcus Smart's coming out year. I think we now look at Marcus Smart much differently, especially with how far Boston went in the playoffs. And I think in general, one of the things all four of us did with all of these Sharks is we picked players. We immediately thought Shark. We thought Scrappy. We thought Tenacious. We thought, you know, aggressive. And I think we still give, because we watch every day and we've seen Marcus Smart's rise gradually, we still see him uh, you know, in that way. But I think there are a lot of people who had no idea who Marcus Smart was a year ago and now know him as the elite defender who got Boston as far as he did. So I think that's we're starting to see a shift on that. And a year from now, even for us, if Marcus Smart does this two, three years in a row, we may start to not think of him when it comes to shark talk, um, you know, because he'll be kind of out of that category of deserves the respect that a shark gets. Now, I will say uh, I've always and I, the, you were implying this. I've always seen him as a very good defender, and I've always, I, I was always leery that of, of all those trade talks of him potentially being a piece that the Celtics were looking to ship out. Um, it's like his his leadership and his defense are very hard to replace, and I ultimately it ended up being ben, super beneficial. J just the, if, if they didn't have turnover issues, there's a good chance. The Celtics would have been your 2022 NBA champions. Mm -hmm. On to the next shark. The Ca -ca! That's the noise sharks make, right? The nurse shark. Mine was at least closer to Flipper. Um, the nurse shark, not particularly fast, not particularly aggressive. Um, however, they can occasionally cause harm to a human if a human is being incautious or ridiculous. Um, and so... 
Um, how do you basically get attacked by a nurse shark? By not respecting a nurse shark. Leave them alone. They're not trying to hurt you. So the question here is simply, who's the NBA's nurse shark? Who are we not giving respect to? Who we probably should be. So again, as I was just talking about, Mark is smart. Uh, he uh, now, granted, he's aggressive, more aggressive than a nurse shark, uh, and he did just win an award. But even still, with that award, a lot of people are saying, "Oh, he wasn't deserving of that." Uh, Rudy Gobert, Bam Adebayo, uh, all these other guys. Everyone was like, "Oh, this guy deserved it over him. This guy deserved it over him." I mean, even I bet you people there are probably people, even though he played like maybe a game, probably were saying Kawhi Leonard deserves it over him. And again, these these are all really good defensive players. But Marcus Smart has been playing this type of good defense his whole career, and he has one of the best leadership players uh, out there, and he just never gets any respect. Boston at points didn't even respect him to the point that they were they were very close to shipping him out multiple times because they were like, oh, we need a real elite point guard. And it's like, well, you have a really good leader point guard already on your team in Marcus Smart. Why not try to incorporate him more? He was a bench player for for a part portions of his career that I thought, why are they benching? Why do they have him on the bench? They should be starting him. And then eventually they started to, and now look at them this year, and he's great. Maybe this com- season coming in, people will be, appreciate him a bit more because he just won Defensive Player of the Year. The Celtics just went to the finals. But uh, until I see that from the media, he, he's not respected. Tommy, who do you got? Um. You know, I, I, I said earlier who I might pick, but, you know, since someone else picked it, I want to go something different. I'm going to go to Jonte Murray. Oh, a little San Antonio Homer cooking here. Here we go. Uh, it, okay. Go on. Um, We're listening. Okay. So, all ears here. Uh, biggest thing is, he sure, he finally made into the all, becoming an all star this year, but that was only because, you know, Draymond Green was like, hey, like, I'm not going to be in it. You really want to pick this guy who, no one seems to be voting for, and that that is a tell right there. Where I feel like he's pretty under underappreciated. Sure, I've got a little bit of beef with him, you know, or th- him leaving for Atlanta and all that, but that's all water under the bridge right now. Because um, I mean, the guy's gonna go out there and get. He's gonna get. He led, he led the league in steals last year. He's gonna get you the steals. He can get you at least twenty points a game. But no one talks about him as much as, as anyone else. I mean, his team losing is certainly part of that. Exactly. You know, but looking at the player all, individually. Right? When he, except, the player for, individually. except for Grayson Allen. Yes. Since I, since I know for a fact you guys are going to challenge my decision here in a minute because I went way off the beaten path for this next one. Did you pick a retired player? I do have to <laughs> no, I make sure all my guys are active. Um, oh, okay. I, I will say, Tommy, I love the choice because he was basically one of the best players on one of the worst teams. Yes. Um, so, I mean, that's going to naturally be a disrespected position. Um, he did just get traded for multiple firsts. Um, it's hard to say he's getting too, too disrespected when he's being think, seen with that amount of value in the league. But I do agree with you. During the season, if I, I could put an asterisk, I do think – paying attention to him. Yeah. If I could put an asterisk, I do think I, going forward he's going to get the respect he deserves. Mm, Absolutely. Okay. Especially now being on a bigger spotlight with uh, alongside Trey Young. But, I mean, just those few years in, in San Antonio really, really proved that he was kind of like an underappreciated talent in the league, especially this past season. And that is where my choice comes in, boys. Oh, no, no. Absolutely. Before you, you, spoil, you, so, you soil us with your spoils of yours. That's quite possible. Tell us, Kevin's. Oh, absolutely. Kevin probably picked a player you've actually heard of before. Let's oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Is that a spoiler? Sir? <laughs> no, you, you, you know my guy. You'll just question my decision here. Um, oh, okay. So uh, he went with CJ McCollum um, for his That's who I was originally going to go with. Um, and uh, I, I mean, I, I, I'm going to just try and guess from Kevin here. Um, he always felt that being next to Dame Lillard, he was definitely being, you know, kind of swept aside, which I agree with. It's always tough to be, you know, a softer player, second fiddle there. You know, it's it's easy to be a 1A and a 1B, but I don't think many people saw it that way. I think more people saw it 1 and 2. Um, being that 2 when you really should be deserving to be the 1B is always tough. Um, I also think we gave McCollum – We did. I at least personally, I didn't realize how little respect I was giving C.J. McCollum until I saw his leadership on the Pelicans after he was traded. I really thought he was just going to be miserable there, take 50 shots a game, and then demand a trade. But he really went in there with a very 
scrappy team with no direction particularly and actually seem to be invested in you know wanting to win and wanting that team to be good i honestly don't even remember what i said about him good I'm, I'm, yep i guess that means he's underrated if i don't even remember <laughs> yeah give, give <laughs> cj mccollum some respect but here is what i will say cj mccollum Dejounte murray Marcus Smart, all guys who have either gotten some respect or are well on their way. I agree with you. I think Murray, you know, especially if the Hawks make a run this year, we're going to be talking about him a lot. Now that you're going to be making a run for the bathroom. Oh, weird, but oh, I'll back it up anyway. Um, you know, I think now that Smart has some hardware, we're going to look at him. I went with a guy who there is no this dude. There's no way this dude is ever going to get respect because if he would, he would have gotten it by now. And so I figured now he's going up his respect. No, right idea. So. Here's sort of my logic. Hear me out. When Jeremy Lin came to town almost a decade ago now, it was hard to, even though he came out of nowhere, it's hard to say he was underrated because since we didn't know what his ceiling was, we didn't know how long this flash in the pan was going to last. We didn't know if we'd been misjudging him or if the dude just got super hot and happened to be in the coolest media ever, desperate for, for a feel good story. If you truly want to be underrated, you need to be underrated every single day, year after year. That's how you become truly an underrated player. You're given the most opportunities to be ignored. So I took a look at the game's played list to help me out to try and find somebody here. There were exactly five players, only five players in the NBA last year who managed to play all 82 games. Four of those guys are 25 or younger, meaning the young guys can do it. The fifth guy is 30 years old. There's only one 30 year old and he's five years older than anyone else who can play any game. If that's not underrated right there, I don't know what is by virtue of the fact he's just more available than any other veteran in the league. I'm on the edge of my seat. Any, any guess, Kilroy? I, I know. I have no we've, idea. We've openly trashed this dude throughout the season. It's Dwight Powell guys. It's the Maverick center. Dwight Powell. Oh, I, thought, only I, thought, guy above I was going to be like, Kevin Love is older than, it's older than that. So, you know, you referenced that Marcus Smart has been benched by Boston before. Dwight Powell was cast off in Boston. He was the throw-in in in the Rajon Rondo trade. This is a dude who was literally given zero respect. And then... Been by us all the time. And, yeah, I mean, we... uh, Tommy, I don't think you were with us when we were doing the playoff shows, but every step of the way we said the other team has a center, the Mavericks don't. And I get that he's 6'10", but he doesn't play like a center. He's not a shot blocker. So we assumed Phoenix would run right over them because Aiton would just run over Dwight Powell. And he, but this dude is scrappy. He gets the job done with zero respect because he's not seen as a center. He's seen as the token big guy on the Dallas guards. You know, no one thinks of Dallas as a big team. And he's just there to get the rebounds. But he does two things that get no respect. One, he is a glue guy in that locker room. Any article you read about Dallas... Dwight Powell holds that team together. Secondly, if you look at metrics or if you just watch the tape, he is an elite screen guy. He sets great picks. He's great on the pick and roll. And despite being an undersized center, so he has to get scrappy sometimes, and despite setting a ton of picks, dude only averaged 2.9 fouls per game. So on a team that's not particularly known for its depth, the fact that he can be as scrappy as he is and still be active every game and stay out of foul trouble every game That's a lot to like about this guy for a guy that we give no respect to. So I know it's an unorthodox choice, but he's incredibly disrespected for what he is, which is a starter on a, on a Western conference finals team. I agree. Uh, That's a good choice. That concludes my Ted talk. (laughs) (laughs) We all, uh, we don't, we don't respect him enough. Um, We just don't. I'm sorry. Dwight Powell, you're my new, you're my new boy. I got you. We're going places. You're not going to be my new boy, but I will have more respect for you. I wish you were a little bit worse of a player or at least got injured, not injured, but at least took a day off here and there so we could finally see uh, Boban <laughs> do something. Um, <laughs> Boban's, but, uh, good Boban, old Boban. Boban's, Boban's not there anymore. He got moved in that Houston trade. So now now Dwight Powell can play 100 games for all I care. But the, now, Boban's the, also like 80. But you, part of the reason Boban never played last year is because Dwight Powell literally, you know, they, they never needed the backup center to start a game. Um, That's fair. On to the final shark. Shark. The bull shark. This is the bull shark. The bull shark is aggressive. 
and it is very dangerous to humans. It can live in salt, fresh, or brackish water, making it very unique. And so who is our NBA bull shark, meaning who plays a diverse game that can be used in many different scenarios? I got first time NBA all-star Andrew Wiggins. Ooh, okay, I like that. So for those of you playing along at home, listening along at home, home, blah, 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 home, Andrew Wiggins became an all-star for the first time this year. He learned to play defense. He learned to become a better rebounder. And he was very, very important to the, the Warriors winning the NBA Finals. He was arguably their second best player throughout the Finals. Um, and he he can go out and become – be he, there's a chance that next year, if he wanted to, he could lead the league in rebounds because he, he finally learned how to rebound and how to put an effort. To, he has changed so dramatically as a player. He's willing to be a role player. But he's not really a role player, but he's willing to be a role player where he, he, he's fine with not having to be the guy. And, and what's weird is there's trade talks that he might be moving, that the Warriors might sign him to a max deal just so they can trade him. I don't understand why you would do that. He's relatively young. He's still in his 20s. I, I, You pair him with Jordan Poole. You can start moving on from Clay. You can start moving on from Steph in a few years. Steph, I think, is the same age as us, Mongo, right? Around uh, 33, 34, something like that. Somewhere in that range. Um. So you're not going to have him for too many more years. Why would you get rid of a potential, you know, key piece? And Clay is coming from many major injuries, and maybe Clay is. I personally would be potentially moving him on from him more so. But I understand the history there with him being a splash brother and stuff like that. But to me, Andrew Wiggins, he can do a lot of unique things. His defense is improved, his rebounding is improved, and his overall love for the game has improved. The Warriors revitalized this man's career. Yeah, that would be my one. Uh, first, I think it's a great choice. I think if you were trying to, if I, if this was a game and I was trying to win, proving my shark was better, um, the one thing I'd say is I don't know how much of that, you said it right there at the end, how much of that is Andrew Wiggins developing a complete game and how much of that is the Warriors seem to be able to do this with just about anybody. They seem to be able to take anyone's game and make it more diverse than it was when they came in. Um, but I agree with you. I think Wiggins is a great choice for this. I think you can pretty much, you know, you have to be flexible to play with the Splash Brothers. It just comes with the territory of it being their town. Um, I also personally, I know we're getting off topic here for a second. I don't know if I fully believe the Andrew Wiggins trade talks. I get that they're out there. I get that they're prominent. But the problem with this team is when you you, you can't say, oh, we're going to trade Steph Curry. That would cause anarchy in the greater San Francisco area. Like, you can't trade the Splash Brothers. You're not going to trade the young guys because it would sound like, you know, all of these smart draft picks were for – like, who could you honestly just dangle out there if you're just trying to keep the phone active during the offseason? He's probably the best bait you have right now. Um, so I, I think that's why they have him dangled out there more than anything because then once you get that phone call, then you can start discussing – you know, whatever, your eighth man for a future second rounder or something, you know, that sort of thing. But you need to get the phone ringing, and I think they're using Wiggins more as bait than anything. But good choice all around. Tommy, who you got? <laughs> so this one was the was the toughest one for me to pick because it was like I wasn't sure if I should go someone, a big name, someone who's kind of not, not as big. Ultimately, I ended up going with Giannis. It's probably the easy pick there. Oh, I went Giannis. Oh, oh, Giannis. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Giannis. Yeah, he seemed probably the easy pick there, but like I was having trouble trying to figure this one out. All right. Well, that's a good, that's a good choice. I mean, the guy, the guy can adapt his game to any situation. I mean, that's there's a reason smart. he's like, there's a reason why he's like one, of, he's like one of the top players in the league, if not the top right now. Yeah. I mean, he, he's, 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 this is very similar to my pick from last year. Uh, last year, I picked LeBron James, I believe, is who I had. <laughs> and obviously, LeBron James is, is able to do everything. Same with Giannis. Giannis is able to do everything. The guy should be in more defensive of the year, uh, uh, defensive player of the year talks than he is. He's one of the best outs, uh, one of the best all around players in the league. That was that's a great pick, Tommy. 
Tommy, pass the buck anytime you want because spoiler, I have the same guy. So <laughs> obviously, it's a it's a great. It's feel a, free to feel free to take over then. Um, I'll get on the Giannis train in just a moment here, but uh, just so we all know, Kevin had um, Joel Embiid. Um, he felt that his three point shooting really adds a new element where he can obviously go inside, outside. He's getting pretty good defending on the perimeter. Obviously, elite defender in the post. Um, so he does a little bit of everything. Um, he felt he's really kind of developing a, a 1990s style game, um, which Kevin I tend to agree with. Soft in his old age. I know he picked a sixer. Who knew? <laughs> who, who knew? Um, so yeah, Tommy, I'm with you completely. I went with Giannis. I and so here's my thing. Um, let me give the shameless plug here for I80 Sports. Uh, if you're out there watching, keep watching all week because all of the sports are going to be doing something for shark season. And so some of these sharks are better tailored towards certain sports. I feel this last one's rough for the NBA because it's a star driven league on offense. If you are a star, you're out there no matter what. So it's not like I'm picking which star is more versatile on offense. They're all versatile on offense. That's why they're super duper stars. So Tommy, I ended up with Giannis for the same reason as you. I went to the defensive side of the ball. Um, Again, uh, the NBA GMs back in, Sept- I think it was October, took a survey. I-, I mentioned this before. They went best defender, best perimeter defender, and they went best versatile, most versatility on defense, which really is what we're talking about here, right? Versatility. And their top five was uh, Antetokounmpo, Simmons, LeBron, Kawhi, Draymond Green. And that's a fantastic five. It's a fantastic five. But since we're talking versatility, I had to knock out the two that didn't actually play this season because you're not really versatile if you're not actually on the court. And then of the three guys who were left, um, Giannis played about 67 games. LeBron played 50-something, and Draymond played about 40-something. Um, so I just made the tiebreaker, effectively, who was the most active. You know, you had to be actually out there to be used in the most situations. Um, but LeBron would have been a fine choice. Wiggins is a fine choice. Obviously, I went with Antetokounmpo. Um, but again, more for the defensive versatility. Anyone who can guard the one through five like that, uh, you know, that's that's a true shark to me. All right, everyone. Thank you so, so much for joining us. Uh, Tommy, as always, it's muchly appreciated that you join us. Mongo, thank you so much for joining us. Kevin, we're sorry you couldn't join us. Kevin had no power t- in his home. Hopefully he has that back now. Uh, so again, thank you all for joining us. Remember, like, share, subscribe. Ring that bell. Uh, comment down below who you would have picked for your Mako shark, your great white shark, your hammerhead shark, your nurse shark, and your bull shark for the NBA All right, or any sport. I don't really care. <laughs> Just comment, please. Please. We need Love those comments. Us. <laughs> and again, for those of you listening to us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts and all those other podcasting platforms out there, come check us out on YouTube. You can see our pretty faces and you can comment as well. And for those of you who listen to or watch us on YouTube, go check us out on those other platforms. This way you can just only hear our pretty lovely voices. voices. Anyway, we'll catch you all next time. Hey, Kilroy, what was Jaws' favorite Christmas uh, carol? I have no idea. Shark the Herald Angels Sing. Have a great night, everybody. Why we can't have nice things.